Hi, I'm Christina O'Neill, Editor-in-Chief of WSJ Magazine. I'd like to welcome you to The One with supermodel and businesswoman Ashley Graham. As one of the most influential and outspoken models and activists of her generation, Ashley has helped redefine an industry and represents the future of fashion. That's why we wanted to feature her on the cover of our spring fashion issue. Last week, I caught up with Ashley to celebrate her cover and discuss life as a new mom and her remarkable career. And now, the one and only Ashley Graham. Hi, Ashley. Hi. I'm so excited to be talking to you tonight and thank you for joining us. Yes, of course. It's so good to see you again. Sorry, it's yeah. not in person. And for being on the cover of our spring fashion issue. <laughs> I just got my copies too. I saw your YouTube video this morning, which brought me so much joy. <gasps> oh my your gosh. face had... when you opened that box. I had so much fun making that because you know, you, I got to see the cover digitally and then, but to see it, you know, in the Feel flesh, it. it's a whole other cover. Oh. And it's a thick one. Oh, it's a fashion it's issue. So, so that it's like nice and meaty. It I is. Meaty. It. it is. I need to frame it. That's an iconic photo. Thank you for yeah, choosing no, a great photo. <laughs> sure. uh, one, one time I had an agent tell me that um, bad co covers happen to good people. So um, I'm always <laughs> appreciative of a good cover. Oh gosh. Well, I hope you don't have too many of those <laughs> like, <laughs> turned around in frames somewhere in your attic. Um, but I just loved that you were dressed up and it felt super glamorous and like you were, I had somewhere to go. What was it like after all these months in like lockdown to kind of get glammed up and live a fantasy glamorous life again? Oh my gosh. I mean, it always feels good. It always feels good to walk into um, glamour in a way. And, uh, but you know, it's, it's been weird. It's been weird these last few months. And um, I have to say getting on set and, and knowing that everything was safe um, really put everybody at ease, but it just kind of felt like back to normal in like a really great way, except for I was pumping. I pumped a couple of times um during the day i which, loved you know, the video you posted where you were talking about having like 17 packs of hair on and you're like pumping yeah. that was probably the most glamorous multitasking i've seen ever okay. i gotta keep it real and like pumping is such a chore and it's exhausting to have to keep up so um that you know there, there's that but it felt so good to be back on set yeah are you still pumping no, I'm actually actively trying to wean right now. Oh, good for you. Oh my God. It's very difficult, but we're on our way and I'm hoping by next week, um, it'll be over. Yeah. Cause he's one, one in one month. Yeah. Almost a month. Uh, yeah. one in almost one in one month. Yeah. And yeah. I, I just feel like, okay, I got to a year. Congratulations. That's an amazing milestone. You should be so proud. Thank you. And I mean, I don't know how dedicated you were, but I'm sure that was probably one of the silver linings of the pandemic, being able it, to be home and like commit to was. breastfeeding. I have to say, like, I feel bad for the second kid because I just don't know what kind of one-on-one um, -on -one treatment they're going to get compared to Isaac. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because... no, he definitely has been spoiled. Having so I got eight time. months. I got eight months of one-on-one -on -one time. And then it was like, yeah. oh, I'm just headed to Milan for four days and I'll be right back. Like, yeah. it's it's been a... Yes, the silver lining has been that I've been able to stay home. It's been amazing. Yeah. Now tell me about that trip to Milan. I'm lucky I get to do my job from home. I can watch all the fashion shows from the convenience of my apartment, but obviously your job is to turn up. Yeah. And what was it like to be on the runway again after all that time, not to mention after having a baby? It felt good. <laughs> I have to say, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know like how working mothers feel all of them, but I know for me, like I couldn't wait to get back into work and having, you know, being a mom and being stuck at home is one thing, but then add the pandemic on top of it. It's like, you really can't leave. So to be able to travel again felt so good. And um, to be on the runway and the glamour and the Fendi and the Etro and the fashion, like it was great. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, obviously like you're a working mom, like you get it. Like we want to be role models for our kids and let them know like you can we also love a, a night of room service in a hotel. <laughs> I 
tell you what, I got invited to a few like outings and I was like, sorry guys, like this is mommy's time. (laughs) No, I mean, it's a hard balance, but sometimes those trips almost feel like a vacation, even though you're working. Yes. Weird kind of, you know, you feel like a different level of guilt, but at the same time, it's sort of you time. So it was my first kind of um, feeling of guilt, I guess you could say, because I was like, I was trying to bring him with me, but because of COVID, it made it very difficult with the visa. And then I realized four days in Milan is more torturous for him than, than him staying home with dad. So that's what we did. Yeah. And the sort of pangs of like, you're here and you think you have like 45 minutes and you can run back to the hotel and all of that. Honestly, my advice is leave them in, in New York and you go do your thing. And, like, and I know that now. Really and well. thank God I did that. Thank God yeah. I did that. Yeah. So, I mean, the runways look a lot different now, certainly from when mm-hmm. you started size, inclusivity, body positivity, you know, those are all almost a given for shows, mm-hmm. but that wasn't always the case. Um, I think a lot of that progress can be credited to you. Oh, well, thank you. Wow. Um, but I'm not saying the fashion industry is where it should be at all. Oh, it's definitely not. Well, first of all, that's a very nice compliment. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there is a lot of change that's happened. Um, I have to say, it's just still not enough. The fact that, you know, we're still praising designers for that one curvy girl for that one season. It's not enough. You know, we need to see different types of curvy girls. We don't, we're not all created equally. But what I find so shocking is now it's either everyone's like still super skinny Obviously, we're not going to like, you know, move so far away from what the tried and true sample size has always been mm-hmm. to a couple of curvy girls. Mm-hmm. Where's the size eight woman? Where's the size six woman? Like there are these kind of extremes. And I have never seen a woman who looks like me on the runway in that sense, you know, where you're just sort of like, oh, hi, I'm just an average person. Mm-hmm. And I feel like an average person is either whittled down to this kind of, you know, sample size mentality or passed over entirely. I know. And this has been the problem. It's all about the quote sample size and designers want to say that, you know, this is our sample size and this is what it is, but they're the ones who actually get to structure what their, um, what their, what, how they run their business. And a lot of designers their sample size is a size two. And then if they do curvy, it's a size 12 or a 14. Um, and everybody in between and everybody bigger is always forgotten. So when it comes to runway, they're only putting the sample size on. And, and it's, it is frustrating. It really is. Um, and it, and it also is frustrating how they label people because, um, the girls who are like your size are called the in-between girls. And it's like, you're in between like super skinny and you're in between, you know, curvy plus size, whatever. And it's like, why are we constantly labeling women? Why do we have to like tell people like, oh, it's the like really uber skinny girl or like, oh, the really uber curvy girl. It's just like, we are who we are not because of a number inside of our pants. Yeah, no, totally. And then you see the representation on the runway and that doesn't always translate into the boutiques. No, because then it's a buyer situation. Right. So it's like a whole nother round of people you have to educate, you know? I know. Well, and then the buyers will say, well, we're just buying for like what sells. But if you go to the racks, you see that the bigger sizes are always sold out and they're yeah. always sold out because they don't buy enough of those sizes. Anytime I go to the store, which hasn't been in over a year, yeah. um, <laughs> It is like the 14s are gone. The 16s are gone. Like it just is what it is. But if buyers started doing more of that, we would have, um, we would have more access. And on top of that, I mean, it's like a constant cycle. There's also the grading issue um, where when designers are going to college and design school, they are not being educated on what grading is for bigger sizes. So they're only grading for a smaller size frame and they don't know how to dress a curvier woman with in luxury. You know, they've made us tense and they've made us moo-moos up the wazoo but when it comes to structure it's just it's not there for a bigger size girl yeah i know there's a lot more educating to be done mm-hmm. but that said the fact that you're a global supermodel i feel like <laughs> it's just proof that we've come such a long way from when i, I so. in the industry from when you started in the industry to now i think so and you know when i showed up on set um it was wild because first of all dara is 
iconic. She's the stylist. I'm, so, I was so excited to see that she was going to be the stylist for the, sh for the shoot, because I've been following her. She's so beautiful. She was a model before. So she gets like all sides of everything. And the clothes were so epic that I was texting my team back for, in, in the dressing room. And I was like, you guys, I am, I am like shocked because everything was fitting. Everything was high end, everything. Like she was getting creative with the clothes that also didn't fit. There was like some, um, Saint Laurent, um, uh, pants or a jacket or something that obviously yeah, turned into like a can -can -can skirt. <laughs> it was two skirts put together. Yeah. I was like, what is happening? Yeah. So, you know, and that's the thing about fashion. Like you get creative, you have fun. And, and, and that's what that, the whole shoot really was. Like, it was also a representation of, of my last 21 years of just like high end, like finally like put a curvy girl in high end and like drip her in glamor and let her know that like she is a queen and a goddess and like you can be curvy and all of those things. Yeah, no, I thought the fact that A, it was all fashion, nothing was custom, nothing was reworked, right. nothing was all of those things, which is what historically has had to happen to, to dress anyone who's not a sample size, let alone, you know, two, three, four years ago, you know what people were doing to alter the clothes. And I think the fact that we've come so far is really remarkable, but I just love that so you're that. the face of a movement and that you've been so vocal and so active and you're talking to designers and you have such a great voice. I mean, what does it mean to you to be a supermodel in 2021? Well, you know, it's hard to answer this question because in so many ways, like I don't feel like a supermodel. I feel like, I do feel like a role model. I do. And the business of who I am has just been about working with what I have. And um, I've just kind of put myself into every situation and I've led with what haven't I had that I have wanted. Um, and so to get the crown of supermodel always feels like a little bit strange because I think of, you know, Cindy and Linda and Naomi and Giselle, you know, I, I, those are my supermodels. So, but I'm honored. Even in your conversation with Naomi Campbell, she said she struggled with being called a supermodel, yeah. <laughs> which is like, come on, Naomi. <laughs> I'm not sure I believe that one, but I don't believe her. I don't believe her at all. Another label. I think she was having a humbled moment, but yeah. I don't believe her. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, you know, confidence doesn't come in a can. It isn't something no. that you can just sort of, you know, women don't wake up and just sort of, you know, feel amazing every day. And I think you've put such a voice to a lot of people's insecurities and perceived shortcomings and crit criticisms about themselves and, I just think the conversations you're having, you know, in all the platforms that you, you know, represent on are so important. I certainly didn't have anyone like you growing up. And the fact I that my either. daughter, you know, is 14 years old and she is at that crucial age where you're like, ah, you know, she starts to say things and you're like, oh God, that sounds like we're teetering into, you know, that sort of like mm -hmm. scary zone where you, you know, start to worry. Um, just the fact that you're there, and you're a voice for these women is like so reassuring. Thank you. I, gosh, I mean, that's like the compliment of all compliments. I, I really wish that I had someone to look up to when I was younger. I had my mom who was, I have to say, like, I'm so lucky that I had someone who didn't look in the mirror and say that she needed to lose weight or that she was looking old or that she didn't like herself. She always called herself strong. She liked her height. She loved her personality. She loved her loud laugh. And, and I have all those things that she has. Yeah. So if she were to start saying that she hated something about herself, then I was going to start criticizing myself. Yeah. Or worse, and, like putting you on a diet or like in oh the insidious kind of like, let's exercise together. Like, you know, like one of those yeah. like wink wings. Like I have to say, like my mom was really good about keeping us active and like involved yeah. in things. And her, her reason for it all, she says that she kept us involved in many things because it kept us out of trouble and she didn't want us to get into any trouble. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Fair. <laughs> yeah. And so besides your mom, did you have other role models growing up? 
Not really. I mean, you know, I can say that I had a Marilyn Monroe poster over my bed. Um, and I thought that she was, you know, I loved her pointy boobs and her round hips, but other than that, and I loved her sex appeal because I, at such a young age was already oozing sex appeal, but didn't know how to channel it. Yeah. So I just kind of, I don't know, I leaned towards Marilyn because she was like the only iconic curvy girl. We had JLo, you know, but um, not really. Yeah, that's too bad. I mean, I think that says a lot about our culture. It does, but look now, I mean, between any social media, like TikTok, Instagram, um, we've got movies, we've got, we've got TV shows. I mean, there are curvy girls everywhere now. Yeah. No, and I think we're celebrating women for a lot more than just how they look. I mean, yeah. I love that personality, I think, is what is driving this generation of, of supermodels. I agree so much. I think that, you know, to be a supermodel is to be more than just a pretty face or a, quote, hot bod. It's, <laughs> it's really about, like, who are you? What are you portraying? What are you changing? How are you uh, making an impact in the world? And the younger generation will call you out for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. Do you get a lot of feedback on social media from your fans and your followers? Oh, I, I think that social media is like, it's like you're signing up to get uh, feedback. It just is what it is. But I have fun. You know, there's always going to be the negative comments. Um, there's always going to be people giving you the unsolicited advice. But I, I really have such a good time with my followers. I send on Instagram, I send voice notes. Um, I just became like, I'll send like a girl, I see you. I love this DM. Like, you know, I think that it's so fun to just get really personal. And I just became a TikToker. Um, I'm currently blowing up on TikTok. <laughs> I'm going to have to find you. Um, but I'm having so much fun. And I just realized that you can send video messages back to people. So I'm about to go in. Uh -oh, on that. Uh -oh. Are you on Clubhouse? I, I haven't done it yet. I haven't I'm, cracked that one either. I'm just kind of like watching over my husband's shoulder. Like, what are you guys talking about? But yeah. I don't know. I like that it's just voice though. Yes, I, I like that. And it's yeah. like, it feels like educational and it also feels like you can actually learn something and you're not just getting entertained. Yeah. No, it feels more like entrepreneurial or people making connections and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know if I can handle another platform now. <laughs> There's so many. I have, like, I don't know how you do your phone, but everything for me has to be kind of, like, categorized. So I have, like, media, and, like, it's way too many. It's way yeah. too many apps in media. It's just a lot. Yeah, no, I know. It's too much. Well, let's get back to the old-fashioned media that, that I'm in, the print media business, or one of the realms that we exist in. Um, I'm curious to hear about your very first Sports Illustrated cover, oh. um, which I know was such a groundbreaking moment. Um, and that was in 2016. Yes, Can you, that is, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, just tell me a little bit about that. And I'm curious what your feelings about Sports Illustrated are now that you're a mom. Oh, wow. Sports Illustrated now that I'm a mom. I mean, I think that it's great. I think that what MJ Day is doing there is great. She's talking about everybody. And that's important yeah, because it's everybody a lot from just being that kind of. Yeah. Just from like being like a sexy girl magazine or like issue that came out once a year to like, now we're, we're praising every type of body and skin tone and gender and, um, background. Like it's iconic and congratulations sports illustrated for actually moving with the times. Cause a lot of magazines yeah. haven't done that. Yeah. Um, but in 2016, I mean, that's, that's the day that changed my life forever. I mean, being on the cover of sports illustrated was a thought that I, I, I mean, I never even had that thought. I didn't think that a girl like me could be on the cover of sports illustrated, let alone, um, a curvy girl be on the cover of sports illustrated. So, um, I still play that, that moment where Nick Cannon came over and was like, and three covers. And it was like Rhonda, Haley and I, and I snatched the mic out of Nick Cannon's <laughs> hand. And I was like, I'm taking over the world. And I was like, oh, that was like really aggressive, Ashley. You need to calm down. But, but that's just, like, look where you are. <laughs> but like in my head, I was like, yes, like curvy girls, here we come. Like, like the world has no idea what's about to happen. 
Yeah, no, I think it was really groundbreaking. And then you had another big moment on the cover of Vogue when you were photographed pregnant by Annie Leibovitz. That must have also been a pretty momentous moment for you. That, that was, and I always call it kind of my shared cover with Isaac, um, <laughs> my in, in utero <laughs> baby. That was, um, what an amazing moment to be able to share with him later. Um, it's like the cover of Vogue by yourself and uh, I'm pregnant. And then Justin got to be in it with me. And yeah. Annie Leibovitz is a dream to work with. And I was naked in like this forest, forest in Staten Island. I mean, it's not really a forest, but you know, we made it look like a forest. It was a dream. <laughs> Yeah, I wasn't naked on the cover, but I was naked for some of the shoots and or some of the shots, but we ended up not using those and we put a little shirt on. But you have those pictures, I hope, somewhere. Oh, yes. Annie sent them to me. She's a dream. Great. Good. Now, the road from Sports Illustrated to Vogue wasn't, you know, a kind of straightforward one. <laughs> you heard a lot no, of in your career. You know, at what point did you realize that you were starting to be listened to and, and taken seriously by the fashion industry? You know, it's interesting that you say from Sports Illustrated to Vogue, because it actually, the nose started way before Sports Illustrated. Um, I have started modeling when I was 12 years old. I'm 33 now. And I didn't understand what modeling was. I had no idea what the concept of fashion even was. I was in Lincoln, Nebraska, and I was just a, you know, I was, I was a size 12. I was 12 years old and I was five, nine. I'm just like geeky girl really like I was into sports and to have this progression of being thrown into different avenues in the fashion industry and being told no and being told you're too fat and being told you're not you know pretty enough or you're I've even heard like oh you're too pretty for this like it just would never work for you um I had to like gain and and grow this really thick skin and I think, you know, thank God I come from a background where my mother is a farmer, my dad is an entrepreneur, and they heard no and they heard get up and go a hundred times over in their whole lives. And that's how they raised me. So I kind of already had a thick skin, but the no's that I had were kind of ammunition to, to turn them into yeses and to keep going because I knew that I was good enough. It was just a matter of somebody else on the other side actually realizing it. And I've had, I have to say like, I've had phenomenal agents and managers. I have had people who have really believed in me. And, um, and I will say like agents are the ones who will open the door for models, but it's our job to get invited back. And I always worked hard at that invitation back and it, and it paid off. Um, but the, I still get no's, you know? And I think that, that that's kind of fun now because I'm like, oh, that means that this is a goal for me. And I can't wait for that goal to have another check mark next to it because you said no. <laughs> is there anything you said no to that you regret? Regret? No, mm -mm. there's nothing I've said no to that I regret. Um, I really live by the take time to make a decision, sleep on it and have no regrets in the decisions that you do make, because I'm not a type of person that I ever want to live in a regret. I want to just learn from every decision I've made. Yeah. So you host a podcast called pretty big deal. I love the name. Can you tell us a little bit about the title? Yes. My husband actually named it, Justin. He said, um, you know, you're, when you're naming something, it's so difficult. You're racking your brain. Like it has to be perfect. It has to be so, Oh, Justin, you're smart. What do you think? And he's like, well, everybody calls you pretty for a big girl. So why don't you just call it pretty big deal? Because you're only going to have pretty big deals on the show. You're my pretty big deal. And you're a pretty big deal to yourself. And because I do love myself and, <laughs> and, and it just all the boxes. Yes. It just stuck. And as I was emailing everybody and having those people email their everybody's everybody kept coming back with, I love it. I love it. I love it. So, um, and you now it's, it's pretty thank perfect. You. Thank you. And now I have a production company, pretty big deal productions. And, um, and no, it's a great brand. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you've had Kim Kardashian, Chelsea Handler, Jada Pinkett, Demi Lovato, Gail King, the <laughs> list goes on Gail King, who you had a moment with to celebrate your cover, which was incredible. 
Yes. I don't uh, know. Was there anyone you were super nervous about interviewing? I was definitely nervous to interview Kim. I mean, that, that interview, like I prepped a lot for, and then I feel like I totally tanked like the first 30 minutes of it. Cause I was fangirling out. I was like, oh, and this hairdresser that you work with, I booked him and that makeup artist. I, I loved it when he did the wing thing. And I'm like, oh my God, Ashley, calm down, calm down, Ashley. And, and then I, and then I like went into my, like, okay, I am a journalist, but like not a journalist. I'm just like having like fun. And she opened up and we had a great time, but you know, I think it's all in the prep. It's all, it's all in like, I walk into every interview saying, okay, what am I going to learn today? And I always leave having learned a few things that I never knew. And I'm, and I'm so grateful for that. And I think that that's what podcasts are all about. You want to come, you want to be entertained, you want to learn something and you want to grow. And I don't have time to read books anymore. I am a mom of a one-year-old and it, it's like the moment that I go to bed and I have five minutes and I'm about to open the book, I'm like, yeah. No. <laughs> No, and podcasts are so great for multitasking and your son's not talking yet. So he doesn't know if you've got like AirPods in and you're just sort of like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. All it is is mama, dad, dad, and dog. Everything is dog. I don't, I don't know. Do you guys what. have a dog? No, we don't have a dog. But <laughs> he got balloons. Sending you a signal. His, yeah. He got a balloon sent for his birthday. And one of the balloons has a dog. And now it's like, it's so high. It's like on our ceiling, looking down on him every day. So he's like, dog, dog. Oh, yeah. I feel like you might be getting a dog in the near future. No, not um, unless had, I get a patch of grass that I own. No. <laughs> you had Patrice Coolers on the show and she's one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. And I thought that episode was so interesting where you were talking about raising, a, being an, as part of an interracial family and having your son who is half black. I'm curious, what kinds of conversations are you and Justin having about raising a biracial son? You know, we've been talking about this ever since we started dating. And I think that if you're in an interracial relationship, you have to talk about race. It's it's um, the white person's duty to really truly understand the black perspective as much as they can. They'll never fully get it, but they have to have that conversation. And families, whether you're mixed race, black or um, white or anything in between, you should be having race conversations, period. Um, but as far as raising a young black boy, mixed race boy, um, you know, our, our conversations have been about, you know, how are we going to educate him in this? You know, Justin obviously is going to be taking the lead because this is something that I don't have any experience in, but I am there for the support and um, I'm educating myself as much as I can and um, there for, for both of my boys. Um, but this is a crucial time where people, um, you know, it's not about having to learn. It's about like, it's our duty. It's our duty to understand and it's our duty to make change. And, you know, we want the younger generation to be uh, strong, but also to, to be safe. Yeah. Have you personally experienced any racism or negative? Me? Yeah. As a, as part of a interracial couple? I mean, yeah, things happen. I mean, there's all kinds of, I, we get comments and DMs and things like that. And it's so ugly and disgusting. And it's kind of like a pit in your stomach. Um, but Justin is really good about, you know, how, how we handle it. And this comment that he said to me one time, and I'll never forget it. And I repeat it all the time is racism is always surprising. It's, oh no, wait. Racism is never surprising, but it's always hurtful. And it's just like, oh gosh. And how do you think you'll educate Isaac as a young man to be proud of himself? Like, what do you think the mother's role in kind of raising a biracial son will be? Well, I think I'm not gonna be looking at him like, oh, my biracial son. You know, I'm looking at him like, this is my son and he needs to know where he comes from. He needs to know his background. And, and I think that, like I said earlier, like Justin will really take a lead when it comes to um, the black conversation, but I will always be there for support. And, um, and for Justin and I, we're a team. We always talk about how we're a team and we do everything together. And, you know, he is, he is my rock 10 years married you know, we made it through the you guys pandemic. Met in church. 
we met in church. I mean, that's um, the quaintest thing I've heard in, <laughs> in ages. <laughs> so I, I you know, like, where can I meet a man? I've never thought send him to church. I know that's what, I mean, my mom told me just go to church, just, you know, just go for a little bit. And thank God I listened to her because that's where I met the love of my life. Yeah. And how have you been kind of keeping your faith and, and keeping up with your religion and the members of your Christian community during the pandemic? Are you? Well, I don't keep up with all the Christians because there's a lot of <laughs> <laughs> <I mean> whatever. <laughs> all the Christians, Ashley. Hey, everybody. <laughs> no, but like your church members, no, are you? I know. I know. What is a no, Zoom church? Yeah, you they do Zoom, Zoom church. Like, you know, it's interesting, like priorities have changed and, you know, Sunday morning, we, it's really like family time and we turn on worship music and we turn on a sermon and we're listening and, you know, interacting, but Justin and I have always been big prayers. And when we pray, we're, you know, we're not just like begging God for something like we're praising him and we're praising, we're, you know, so much gratitude around us. And I think that, you know, no matter what you believe, if you're speaking out loud and you're talking about all the gratitude in your life and what you're thankful for, like your life will change and your attitude towards the world and, and, and yourself will change. So, um, gratitude and prayer are a big deal in our family. Yeah. No, it sounds like you and Justin have an incredible partnership and it does make me wonder how soon you guys are going to be having another child together. <laughs> I know. I'm so glad that that was in the interview. That was so funny. You were like, like, I'm ready. I'm ready. We're having unprotected sex. Yeah. We're working if, on if it. He's not aware. <laughs> he now can read it in the wall street journal. <laughs> I know. It was so funny when he read it, he was like, Oh, Oh, you're <laughs> caught Ashley. <laughs> No, but it sounds like he's the perfect partner for you. He is. I feel, I feel like, you know, we are definitely, it's so corny, but we're definitely soulmates. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're lucky. Hold on tight. Thank you. So before we wrap, I want to ask you some rapid fire questions, similar to the ones that we ended your cover feature with. Yes. The deep rapid the deep, fire. Thoughtful, deep thoughts. Yes. Um, okay. Ready. Okay. What's the one thing this year has taught you? Ooh. Hmm. Okay. Oh my God. That's such a big one. Wait, 2020 or 2021? Okay. Pandemic time. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 We can um, like reframe. Slow down. Treasure the little things. That's two things, but yeah. They're good things. What's the one thing you missed from the pre-COVID days? Traveling. I mean, hands down traveling. I can't wait to get to Italy and see our family there. What's the one piece of advice you would give to a first time mom to be? Listen to no one but yourself because mama knows best. Instincts. What's the one lie about motherhood? That it, it sucks. Because <laughs> <laughs> the truth is that it doesn't. <laughs> No, I kept hearing like, you're going to be so tired and it's going to be really, you're going to have really hard times. Yeah. And I hated hearing that because yeah, in everything in life, you have hard times, but there's so much blessing with being a mother. And that's what I focus on. Totally. No. And anything new is hard, right? Yeah. But I'm not focusing on that. I'm focusing on the little joy in front of me. Oh, <laughs> what's the one recommendation you would give to an up and coming model? Mm. Oh my gosh. There's so many things. Don't take no. You're going to hear a lot of no's, but keep on going forward because you just never know when you're going to hit your big break. Who is the one person you have FaceTimed the most during the pandemic? Oh, wow. Definitely. Definitely Justin and my best friend, Rachel. And is, are they the same people? that you go to for advice? Is that the one person you go to for business? Advice? I would say Justin is my number one. And then my number two, depending on what it is, is my mom. What's the one trait you won't tolerate in a person? A lie. I hate lying people. I can't stand it. Even if it's white lies, do not white lie to me. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> is there, well, we, we, we touched on this earlier, one opportunity in your career that you turned down and wish you had and no. I, I can't, I honestly can't think of anything, but um, I'll let you know if I think of something. What's the one exercise you try to do each day? Um, a, a exercise breathing. every day? 
No, I don't exercise every day, but I was going to say like, I do like a breathing, like calm exercise, like before I go into a task and I feel like that's an exercise. <laughs> yeah. That's you. Your mind. <laughs> so maybe this is the same thing. What's the one thing you do to unwind? Um, well, I definitely feel like it's open a bottle of Topo Chico with a little bit of vodka and a squirt of lemon and <laughs> sit on the couch and then decide, okay, am I going to watch TV or am I going to read a book? What's the one show you're watching now? Um, oh my gosh. I just started watching fake famous and I have to say like, it's kind of wild. That's the one where they manufacture the influencers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to get all those tips for like how to make a, someone was making a photo and like a the toilet with seat, like, the toilet seat is a plane. I was like, that's <laughs> genius. <laughs> um, okay. What's the one song you've been listening to the most during quarantine? Oh, wow. Um, I think I've been listening to a lot of Khalid. Like he's just very chill and smooth. And I, and I, I love him. <laughs> No, he's awesome. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't realize you could sing, Ashley. I know. A lot of people don't know that, but it's very cabaret and it's very Broadway. But we did get a preview of your vocal chops. So I want to end <laughs> with you giving us a little rendition of A Whole New World. A whole new world. Oh, I have a hole in my arm. A new fantastic point of view. No one to tell us no, no, or where to go. See, look, this is manifestation. <laughs> You're Ariel. <laughs> oh, that was the wrong song. Was it the wrong song? Oh, wait, it's, what is Whole New World? Isn't Whole New World from a uh, Little Mermaid? Wait, a whole new What is a Whole New World? I don't even, it's been No, so it's long. Aladdin. It's Aladdin. It's Aladdin. Yeah, it's right. Aladdin. See, I'm not, I'm, my daughter's 14. I'm like out of the Disney movie. No, and also like, we don't watch like those, the old school ones. We're very like Moana over here. Oh, yeah. Yes. We're, wait till he gets to the superheroes phase. Oh. We're into Iron Man. Oh. Iron okay. Man, which, which is both Iron Man, the character, but then the Black Sabbath song. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Five-year-old who like loves Ozzy Osbourne, you know, totally <laughs> normal stuff happening over here. Oh, wow. I love that. <laughs> um, Ashley, it was so great to spend time with you. I wish, even though we're like a couple of neighborhoods so away in Brooklyn so that we were able to do this in person, but yes. I just want to say thank you so much for being a part of this for being on our cover for bringing your energy and your entrepreneurship your enthusiasm all the words that start with e <laughs> oh well christina honestly like it's a pleasure to be on the cover it's an honor to be on the cover and it's so good to see you again thank you so much for this time it's it, it actually has been a lot of fun great well thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you. i hope to see you soon yes hopefully i'll talk to you soon bye bye Thanks everyone for joining. I hope you're as inspired by Ashley as I am. Please like this video and leave a comment below and don't forget to subscribe to WSJ Magazine's YouTube channel.